Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final week of Can Festival 2021. You are at celebrating and connecting BC Women in Film, TV, and Theater event tonight. I'm Anting, the artist director of Chinese Arts Now. We produce and present the very best contemporary British Chinese arts. Today, the event is as a part of Stay Connected Strength at Cam Festival 2021. Stay Connected is a new strength run by the creative producer Tuye, where we invite all artists involved in Cam Festivals 2019 and 2020 to share their works during the pandemic time. We are very happy that today we have five amazing British East and Southeast Asian women who work in film, TV, and theater to share their work. Jennifer Lim, Ming Yu Ling, Ming Ho, Lucy Xing, and Pig Sun Ling. They are going to share some of their works and chat with our general manager slash producer Jody Gilliam. Now I am going to hand over to Jody. And look forward to hearing this exciting panel tonight. Thank you, Enting. We have an incredible panel for this evening's event, and I have to admit, I've been looking forward to this ever since it was announced back in February. We have five talented women working across theatre, TV, and film in acting, directing, producing, and writing roles. So please bear with me with these introductions, as we have some impressive CVs to hear. So Ming Ho writes for stage, screen, and audio. Her credits include EastEnders, Casualty, Riot Girls, Mail Order for the BBC, and The Things We Never Said, which won the Writers Guild of Great Britain's Best Radio Drama 2018. The Can she wrote Citizens of Nowhere, which premiered at Southbank Centre before transferring to Can Festival 2019 and the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. It also spawned the short film *British People* as part of the *Uncertain Kingdom* anthology, which featured the original cast from *Citizens*, including Jennifer Lim and Pig Sen Lim, who are with us tonight. It is currently available on Amazon and BFI Player, and Ming is currently on Sphinx Theatre's Thirty program, which is main stage plays by female playwrights. Next, we have Jennifer Lim, who is an actress and filmmaker whose work encompasses film, TV, theatre, and radio in the UK and abroad. Her film appearances include Eli Roth's cult horror smash *Hostel*, *A Monster Calls*, and *Piercing Brightness*. She's previously worked at the National Theatre, Birmingham Rep, Young Vic, the Finborough Home, and American Repertory Theatre. Her most recent work includes *I'm Not in Love*, a British rom-com available now on Amazon Prime, iTunes, and Sky. *Freedom High*, which won Show of the Week at Vaults Festival 2019, and *British People* with Ming and Pixen. And Pixen Lim is originally from Malaysia and has appeared on British television regularly since the 1960s, including classic shows *Mind Your Language*, *Doctor Who*, and *The Bill*, and numerous other appearances between 1979 and 2010. She's also known to many as the killer cleaner from Johnny English Reborn. Pixen appeared in Citizens of Nowhere, and her recent works include British People, I Am a Unicorn, and This Way Up for Channel Four. Next up, we have Ming Yu Lin, who is a director for stage and film. She's a creative associate at Headlong and the reader for Traverse Theatre and the Brentwood Prize. Her credits include Does My Bomb Look Good Enough, Soho Theatre, Overheard. No Bond So Strong and Long Way. Ming Yu's short films have won runner-up and finalist awards at Sundance Shorts, Sci-Fi London, and Enter the Pitch. And finally, we have Lucy Sheen, who is an activist, dyslexic, transracial adoptee. She has 40 years' experience as an actor, a published playwright and poet. Her film credits include Ping Pong and Secret and Lies, and she's appeared on stage at the Royal Exchange, Bristol Old Vic, the Royal Shakespeare Company. Her TV work includes *Call the Midwife* and Netflix's latest hit show *Shadow and Bone*. So, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us.、Um, I'll start by asking some questions, and we also have some films to share that the pa panel have kindly prepared for us. Please, anyone watching, do use the chat to share your thoughts on the discussion and the films, and please share any questions that you have as we go. And we'll also have some time for questions. So, to start off.、Um, 
I thought we would start at the very beginning with Pixen. I know Pixen has been having some internet issues. So Pixie, are you able? Oh, okay. <laughs> we can come back to Pixen. Um, so Ming Ho, I hope you don't mind, we'll start with you. Um, you've worked across a variety of media from cornerstones of British TV like Casualty to an award-winning radio play. Could you tell us a bit about how you approach this as a writer? Do you plan out which medium you want to explore or is it more spontaneous? Well, I think as a writer, you, you can rarely plan anything really. Um, so you just kind of pretty much take things as they come. Um, all of these media have different things that are, that are exciting to work on. Um, I worked on EastEnders um, after I had worked as a script editor in TV. So I had had some experience on the other side of the, the desk, as it were. Um, but even so, I think it was still a, a learning curve for me at how all, all encompassing those kind of shows are. You, you just live and breathe the show 24 seven. Um, and it is a big industrial machine and you are a small part of that. Um, Whereas I think the work that I've done for theatre and radio um, is much more kind of personal and it gives you a lot more direct um, relationship with the producer and the director and the actors, um, which I really enjoy. So, you know, I've, I've, I've enjoyed doing those media more recently. Um, and that's obviously where I met um, Pixie and Jen. So that's been a lovely relationship that we've carried over into British People, the short film as well. Okay. So you mentioned British People and citizens of nowhere. So I know I'm biased, but I thought that was an amazing play. <laughs> and it was site specific and immersive. Um, and you worked with Jennifer and Pixen in both. So could you tell us a bit about that experience and what it was like working with the same cast, but in a different medium and making that transition from theatre to film? Yeah. Um, I think the, the thing was that I was commissioned by Chinese Arts Now to write Citizens. And it was a very open open brief. It was just to write a play with three people, which was a live audio. So we already knew it was going to be in the South Bank Center. And I had free reign to create whatever characters I liked. And I created those three characters through interviews that I did with um, British Chinese people and my own experience. And um, we had a very short, quite short rehearsal period. So it was kind of a very organic process. Um, and it was a 45 minute play, which had three stories that were equal stories, a mother, a daughter and a son who all meet in the cafe and they're a Scottish Chinese family. So that was quite a, an interwoven piece of work. So when we came to do the film, that was only 15 minutes long at the most. I think we ended up with 12 in the edit. So we had to condense down and just take out one aspect of that. And we took the story of the daughter um, which we're going to see a clip of later, Jane Lowe, who stands for election as a Tory candidate. And I think I, I had thought that that might be quite a challenge for the actors getting used to doing two different media, particularly because they'd done the first iteration in London and then a year later almost they were going up to Edinburgh. And I thought that might be hard doing the film in between. But in fact, they took to it very easily. And I think it was just because they knew the characters so well by then that, um, that it just came quite naturally. So I think they did, they did really well with it and um, far, far more easily than I expected. Yeah, it was yeah, great, great performances. Mm -hmm. um, so Jennifer, as Ming mentioned, you were a Tory politician and you were brilliant as Jane, the Tory politician. Um, for those of us who know you outside of the role, it was actually quite funny uh, and amazing how convincing a Tory you are. <laughs> um, alongside your successful acting career, you are an activist and producer and your company Moongate Productions responded to the rise in racism against the East and Southeast Asian community with We Are Not Virus, which was a really powerful series of performances that brought attention to the situation. How do you navigate these dual roles of actor and activist? Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Am I? Not yes, <laughs> oh, it's fine. I can hear a slight echo, but I think it's sounding fine from your end. Uh, well, thanks, Jodie, first off, for um, your very, very kind words. Um, yeah, so how do I navigate um, the dual roles of actor and activist? 
I think that's a really good question. Um, I think for me personally, I don't really see them as separate roles. I kind of fell into activism back in 2012 when it became apparent that it was an existential fight and an act of necessity to campaign for better represent, um, representation. And for me, I felt like not engaging in that could possibly spell the demise of being an East and Southeast Asian actor, where you'll forever be consigned to playing stereotypes and continually being othered and placed in narratives that are seen through a non-East and Southeast Asian gaze. And for me personally, I've always felt that to be an actor is to be placed in a passive and vulnerable position. And, and I have to stress, it's just me speaking here. I feel like, you know, as an actor, you're just a pawn on a chessboard in someone else's game. And in order to gain greater control over the type of roles that we collectively want to play and to regain some agency, I felt then and I still feel now that activism is the answer. So instead of being long suffering recipients and observers of systemic and structural inequities or indeed any injustices that we suffer through our work, activism becomes an avenue for us to kind of work tangibly towards bringing about the change that we want to see and to actively engage with um, thorny issues through critical thinking and robust conversations. And I also feel very strongly that, you know, personally speaking, that what both actors and activists seek to do in their own way is to seek for the truth and to bring a mirror up to society and the human condition. And thus, Activism becomes an extension of my work um, as an actor, as a theatre maker, as a filmmaker. And um, my company, Moongate, was founded primarily to do that, to kind of help create roles and to tell stories that embolden and uplift East and Southeast Asians. And I think that so long as we live in an unequal world, you know, where there's systemic and structural inequalities and inequities, there will always be a need to engage with activism. And my work as an actor kind of feeds into that and kind of vice versa. Great, thank you. And I have to say, it's really clear in your work, like you say, that you can combine the two. So, um, so as well as Citizens of Nowhere, you worked on Overheard, directed by Ming Yu, the Cannes Festival last year, in which you played three different characters in the space of 50 minutes, both comedic and dramatic roles. It was quite intense. And you've also appeared in the cult horror film Hostel. So do you have a favourite genre to work in and how do you approach such different moods? Um, okay, I mean, first off, Overheard was such good fun. You know, I mean, a really happy time and as was citizens of nowhere too and you know i think i get like my best roles working with chinese arts now you know <laughs> definitely um and in answer to your question as to whether i have a favorite genre to work in i think my short answer to that is no i mean i i simply enjoy great roles that have an inner life that's um, well written, that's kind of humanized, that kind of enables and allows me to tap into the complexity and nuances of a character. Um, so, I mean, in short, I'm pretty game for anything, really, you know, um, be they drama, comedy, sci fi, horror, thriller, classical, or contemporary plays. Um, the second part of your question is how do I approach such different moods? Um, I think. Firstly, I kind of identify the kind of genre, um, so to speak, so that um, you're kind of aligned with the world of the story. And then I allow myself to be guided by the writing. And I find that good writing will help you pitch and calibrate your performance. And then I kind of play the truth of the situation. Um, in terms of approaching uh, different moods, I find listening to music helps. Um, I don't really have a method um, as such, but I tend to do a lot of research, tons of research um, to help understand the world of the play and the character. And that includes reading, watching films, listening to podcasts, and then it's just trusting the process um, and also the words that you're given and, and also the fellow actors that you're working with. And um, if all else fails, I don't know, I mean, just burn some incense and meditate. <laughs> So a variety of methods there. 
Yeah, very diverse. Um, Pick Sen, are you back with us? Are you able to answer some questions? Is your internet being kind? No. Okay. So we'll we'll try again later. Um, but for now, Mingyu, we talked briefly about Overheard. And I remember with Overheard, you were very excited about the, taking the production outside of London to audiences in Nottingham and York. And your recent collaborators have included Arts Ed students, their showcase Babel, written by Lucy, and the Vietnamese production company Van Tan Productions. So it feels like you have a really inclusive approach working across a wide range of different communities. So could you tell us a bit about how you choose your projects and collaborate? I think to me, um, I don't want to be long winded here, but basically the reason why I even uh, was drawn to working in theatre and to telling stories is because I very, very firmly believe in the power that theatre and the media has to affect really tangible societal change. Um, and I feel that no matter what work we put out there, you're always advocating for something. And it's about how, it's about what you're advocating for and how aware you are of what you're advocating. And so it's, um, I would say that, I would say that that's really important to me when I choose a project. Um, I hope I'm answering your question. On the, because on the one hand, as a director, as a director, you're not as, to, to bring up something that Jen had said, you're not as helpless as an actor. But by the time you are approached to do a project, a lot of things have already been set in stone. The script has been written or the writer has been commissioned. Sometimes the tour is even already booked. Um, and it's not as if you, you have a limited amount of power to push for or influence what kind of project you want. Um, and I have turned down a lot of work that I feel I don't want to advocate for. I think that's, the, that's almost the extent of the power you have to turn down work if you don't think that fits the ethos of the work that you want to put out there or it doesn't give you freedom to, um, to for example, cast exactly the way you want it to. Uh, I, think, I think one way I try and offset this is I work a lot of new writers and I really genuinely am passionate about new writing because that's one way you can nurture a new generation of storytellers and really nurture unrepresented voices. Great, thank you. And you're now working as creative associate at Headlong, which is behind productions such as People, Places and Things and This House. So how did you find the change from freelance to in-house and what are your future ambitions? Goodness, um, it is quite a change. Uh, it's definitely very exciting and very, very um, freeing because Kind of what I mentioned before, as a freelance director, you get approached to do work and by that time, decisions are already made. Whereas when we we're working with Headlong, the artistic team is fairly small and it's been quite exciting and vigorous to be able to have the conversations together so that finally we get to decide who we want to commission, what play should we program, what can we put out there. That speaks to me a lot as, a, as an advocate, so I'm very excited by that. Um, in terms of future ambitions. Uh, you've mentioned how passionate I was about being overheard out of London to regional venues. I, I genuinely have a big passion about regional audiences. Um, I want to see a lot more touring happen. Uh, I want to be able to support a lot of that work and I want to be able to commission a lot of people uh, with from minority so communities and whose voices are more unrepresented. I think that's really um, my future ambitions is quite big because basically what I'm saying is I hope to be able to play some part in making the landscape change. But I do genuinely think there are a lot of people out there who support that as well and that we can genuinely affect that change. Okay, thank you. I know that, yeah, can we are so keen to look outwards outside of London. And that is one you know, small good point about our current digital way of working that people could be tuning in tonight from all over the country, which is really great. Okay, I'm going to try again. Pixen, are you able to hear me? Okay. Okay, I think, okay, we'll, we'll move on then. Um, 
So Lucy, thanks for joining us. Um, so your first professional role, major professional role out of drama school was the lead in the feature film Ping Pong. And so I wondered if you could share a bit with us about that experience. It feels like quite a jump for a fresh graduate. And <laughs> what advice would you give to recent graduates hoping to follow in your footsteps? Um, yes, I mean, I, I graduated from drama school when uh, being a serious actor, you didn't do film or TV. It, it was theatre. Um, bearing in mind that at that point, this country was full of repertory theatre companies, uh, amazing touring companies, uh, ext uh, equally amazing uh, educational departments uh, in, in many of the sort of theatres. Um, so that was, that was the path that you went on. Um, so I sort of did things um, around the wrong way. Um, so, yes, uh, I hadn't, I mean, the beauty about you know, doing anything for the first time is that you, and, and especially when you're younger, you have no fear. So you just, you just do it, don't you? And I hadn't realised how huge the stakes had been until we'd finished shooting on ping pong and Malcolm Craddock who was one of the producers and also the um, owner of, of Picture Palace Films, had said, you do realise if you hadn't cut it over the first two weeks, we would have fired you and hired someone else. And that's the way it goes, isn't it? You know? um, and it's pretty much the same in, in any industry, isn't it? You know, sort of if, if you don't cut the mustard, then you, you're asked to, to go and they find somebody else. So... Um, Yes, I was dropped in the deep end of a very, very large pool and thankfully I, I managed to stay afloat um, and learnt a huge amount due to the generosity of all those around me, um, not least uh, my fellow actors um, and also Po Chi Leung who, who directed the film, which was an, an amazing experience um, and one that as of yet, in terms of the the makeup of of a film unit, and particularly with with cast, I, has yet to be repeated in terms of the amount of British East Asian or South East Asians on an actual production. I'm I'm sure, fingers crossed, that will happen or start to change. Advice for people coming through who um, are brave enough or stupid enough. Um, to want to go into this uh, really crazy business, uh, I can, you know, if if that's what you want to do, then hang on to your dreams and keep going, and never let anybody say that you you can't do it because you can. It just may take a little longer than one would wish. Great, thank you. And so <clears throat> we're about to watch I Know This Face, a short film that you've made for tonight. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give too much away before people see it, and I'll ask you to introduce it in a moment. But you wrote, acted and created this film, and it's a beautiful piece, really powerful. But touching upon things that Jennifer and Ming Yu have said, I think what was also really powerful was that you had complete creative control over this film. And so it felt completely like your authentic voice. So I wondered if you could tell us a bit about your move from actor to writer and filmmaker and how you find that experience of collaboration versus something like this where you were setting the agenda yourself. Um, I mean, obviously, it's great to be able to have creative control um, over what you uh, engage with. Um, I think it's uh, purely from a selfish point of view I got into writing because I was fed up in some senses of consistently being looked for or, or, or considered for the same diet of things that I, I see all the time. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong in, in some of the, the roles that we can tend to look as as stereotypical 
if you have variety, if you have other things to mm -hmm. offset that. And also how, you know, there is nothing wrong in, in, in being asked to play a prostitute or uh, a drug dealer, but it's it's how that character is is formed and, and what goes into that character that that I that will elevate it from the you know the usual stereotypical uh, or racist tropes to something which can be quite interesting and obviously always playing uh, I think playing bad characters or is always a really attractive and interesting thing to do um so actually writing I came to really, really late uh, sort of around about 2008 and then got my first uh, big break in 2011 um and that was purely from a point of view, selfishly, I suppose, trying to create something that was more akin to me or a representation of people that are like me, mm -hmm. that I still rarely see on television, uh, small screens or, or, or large screens or indeed on stage. So it's actually being able to write things that have in some senses never been written before um, or people have not found that subject interesting enough. And, and I'm just coming from a different p perspective of being British and also being or of being East, of East Asian and Southeast Asian heritage. Does that Thank answer you. your question? Sorry. It does. No, it does. Thank you for sharing. OK, so I'll let you introduce the film. And I also want to encourage the audience to think of questions to ask you after the film. If you'd like Thank to you. introduce um, this is a film version of a, a poem I wrote back in 1993 called I Know This Face. I hope you enjoy it. I know this uncharted face, a topography worthy of exploration, an epidermal physiognomy that has lost so much and not just in translation, a misplaced blueprint. I scan the image wondering which features I share with a mother I never knew, or how similar is this face to my mother's? A face that my fingertips will never caress, nor trace the curve of her cheek or feel the flush of her skin. The provenance of my face is unknown. My eyes will never linger over an image of my creator, this face will never see itself in my mother's eyes, or turn over a sepia crackled photograph, puzzling over the copper plate script that says, so and so on this date with mum. Do I age as my mother did? Time drags skin and memories towards the earth. What passing relevance is left? What would the mother of this face recognise? My eyebrow? My forehead? My mouth? And upon seeing my face then say, that's my daughter. I have long surrendered any hope of seeing myself in my mother's eyes, of taking tea in an unfamiliar front room, sensing the colour of a clear water-weak sunshine winter afternoon or pausing with nerves alert to every minor vibration as I ask, Are you really my mother? <laughs> Scenarios play in my head. Dreams of reunion. I run in slow motion through softly diffused colours towards my mother. Waking instead to the mute, motherless tones of reality, having travelled unaware with the pain of accumulated years. Does my mother still walk with measured steps across some path? The meaning of the word mother is lost, almost impossible for me to grasp. In all the intervening years I have felt no anger towards my birth mother. A sad and empty spirit haunts me. The unknown ghost of my mother's lost smile. The silent breathing of an unoccupied chair. Has my mother passed? Looking at this photograph, eyeing with age and experience, my losses and regrets all neatly unpacked. 
I see every individual image interlocking, intersecting, merging, connecting, aligning, forming one complete picture. I cannot change the past, but I can affect my future. I can write my own script, flipping the picture and on the back write. To my darling daughter with much love, Mum. Thank you for that, BC. It's Yeah, it's a really beautiful piece. Um, you mentioned that it was a poem that had, you had written a few years before. So do you find yourself often revisiting your past work? Um, sometimes I'm uh, a bit of a, um, a hoarder from that point of view, or, or should I say I recycle writing? I think quite a lot of writers do. Uh, things that don't go full term or just ideas that you sort of jot down and then reuse because they spark off other things that all are pertinent to the ideas that you're working on at the current time. So, yes, I mean, that started quite, a, that was a, a piece that started life a long time ago and then came into play for an anthology uh, which came out in 2014, uh, which, or maybe later, I can't remember off the top of my head, which was basically um, to do with, it was a collection of, of, people, of transracial adoptees, mm -hmm. um, mainly from America, uh, about the experience of what it means to, to actually be dislocated both uh, sort of heritage-wise and also culturally um, and to have been raised in a culture, um, in a country that you don't always necessarily fit into uh, for various reasons. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting because I've definitely seen more discussion about that over this the past couple of years. So it's interesting that people are being more open about it and interesting that you've then you know, chosen to share that um, with us this evening. And we talked about you coming to writing fairly later, you said. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would not know where to begin with making a film like this in terms of the visuals and um, the graphics and so on. So is that something that you've been exploring um, throughout your career or is again, this something that you are coming to a bit later? Um, I, oh, uh, how do I answer that? I, I had a vision of what I, I wanted to do um, with the piece in order to make it not just, uh, I could have just read it or d just a talking head, which I think, um, I think we've all had a fair um, crack at seeing quite a lot of those. Um, and th there's nothing wrong with that, but I just was interested to see how far in some senses, I could push myself in terms of creating a visual piece um, that would, uh, would complement the words. So um, that's what I went for. And hopefully I didn't do too bad a job. <laughs> it's so impressive, honestly. And I feel like, as you said, you know, that you can have just a focus on one person speaking. But it makes complete sense with you talking about its origin as a poem and to me receiving the piece this is a more poetic way of exploring the visuals so i think it works beautifully so thank, thank you. you um i don't know if we have any questions about lucy's piece oh jennifer is also saying that it's very beautiful um Okay, I think so. Next up, um, I'm going to introduce Ming Ho so that she can introduce our next clip, which is a scene from Citizens of Nowhere, which Jennifer Lim and Pig Sun Lim have kindly filmed for us. So, Ming, would you like to introduce the piece? Yes, thank you, Jodie. Um, this is a duologue between um, two characters, Linda and Jane Lowe, mother and daughter. Um, Linda has been a first generation immigrant who came over from Hong Kong as a child and has since um, got married, built up a business with her husband, lived in Scotland, had two children of whom Jane is one. 
And she's recently got divorced. Her husband had an affair with an employee in the restaurant that they ran together, um, she, he and Linda. And Jane, on the other hand, is a successful businesswoman who has recently decided to branch out into politics. And she has just told her mother today that she is thinking of standing um, as a Tory candidate. Um, but meanwhile, Linda has bigger news that she has decided um, she thinks that she is going to move back to Hong Kong. So that's the scene setter. It's a lot to take in, this Hong Kong business. A long time ago, before I married your father, there was a man at work. At the bank, you mean, when you left school? Yes, the regional office at the university campus. They had a lot of Chinese students there. That's how I got the job, because I spoke Mandarin. I never had to do entry level work in the back office. I went straight to the cashier's desk. You had to look smart. Hair, nails, makeup, inspected every morning. The men too? Did they get their nails inspected? There were no male cashiers, only women. Right. And this man? My boss, the manager. Look, I've never told anyone this. You must promise to keep this to yourself. Sure, whatever. Well, he was older. All the senior execs were in their 40s and 50s, all men in those days. But he was nice, good looking, not too full of himself, a person of culture. He liked the opera and ballet, and he'd been posted out to Hong Kong with a bank. So that's something we had in common. He liked me from the start, singled me out, and so we formed a relationship. You had an affair. I didn't think of it like that. But he was married? Yes, it wasn't happy. His wife was very neurotic. Oh, Mom, that's the oldest story in the book. I was 19. He seemed so sophisticated compared with the boys at school, the waiters in my father's restaurant, even the young men at the bank, all very green in their Hepburn suits. He said, I reminded him of Hong Kong, the exotic East. So he'd had a few bargles out there. He said I was special. An English girl with a Chinese face. Today we'd call that grooming. He beheaded of a tribunal. I was in love with him, I thought. How long did he go on? About 18 months. And then he got posted to a branch in London. I thought he'd take me with him. But of course he didn't. He didn't even tell me he'd gone. I came into work one day and they said there was a new acting manager. We didn't have any mobile phones in those days. I didn't even have a number for him. You could have called his new branch, I suppose, if you knew which one it was. They all knew at the bank about us. I didn't think they did, but once he'd gone, I could see it in their eyes. Pity, disdain. I couldn't bear it, and so I left. That's when I married your father. On the rebound, you didn't love him. Oh, it was different. He'd not long started work in my father's kitchen. I knew he liked me and I just needed someone to take me away from there. Wow. That's why it wasn't a big wedding. We had no money and it had to be quick. You weren't, um... No, I might have been young, but I wasn't stupid. I just needed someone to take me away from that place. The way we heard it in the family, it was a Romeo and Juliet thing, you and Dad. You had to elope because Granddad said he wasn't good enough. Oh, that much of it was true. 
Your grandfather's family were mandarins, very wealthy, until he lost his inheritance at the racetrack. Whereas your father, well, he's a village boy, a peasant, as my father would say. We'd never have met if we'd stayed in Hong Kong. You see, that's the thing about immigrants. People think we're all alike, but we're not. Class matters to us too. Well, our expats flock together abroad when they wouldn't pass the time of day at home. He did all right though, my dad proved himself. Oh yes, yes he did. He's a good man and I did love him. I don't think he really wanted a divorce. He didn't. He pleaded with me. So why? He betrayed me, Jane. Disrespected me. And you couldn't forgive him? Well, once the trust is gone, and everyone knew, all our customers, corporate clients, people at the tennis club, the Rotary, the City Chamber of Commerce. Oh, Mum, you don't have to care what people think. <laughs> you do, don't you? In politics, it is everything. So you're running away again to Hong Kong? So great to see that again, as um, you know, we had citizens of nowhere at Southbank Centre and the festival and the Edinburgh Fringe. So it's fun to see it in a new context. Um, so Jennifer and Pixen very kindly acted that out over Zoom. So when we first had citizens, it was an unusual play in that you were seated within the audience with microphones. And it was very naturalistic. So again, you had it in a new, strange context, still not a straightforward stage play. So how did you find navigating that on Zoom? And maybe Mingyi wants to talk a bit about how it is as a director across Zoom as well. Is that question addressed to Mingyi or is it to me and to Pixen? Oh, sorry. So um, it's to you and Pixen. Ah, uh, okay. Um, Pixen, can you hear us? Uh, I can hear you, Jen. Yeah. So um, Jody was asking, how was it, you know, for us to do this, um, the scene again this time round on Zoom? How was it for you, Pixen? Oh, it 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 was different. It was different. Um, I think I think the essence of the characters are still the same. Um, and I forgot about the technology as soon as the scene started. So in, in that sense, it was interesting. Yeah, I kind of agree as well. I mean, I know that when we did it um, at the South Bank Centre and also at Duddles and um, in Edinburgh too, even though, you know, um, audiences were kind of eavesdropping on us, this time I, I think we still retained that very um, naturalistic element to it too, because it felt very much like a Zoom call between, you know, within the family. So it's a Zoom call um, with mum and Jane and um, and June, who's kind of stropped off somewhere. <laughs> he had a bad internet connection. <laughs> I'll just explain for people who haven't seen the play, June is the third character, he was Jane's brother, who's a very hothead socialist and they just had a row just before this scene. And um, Mingyu, how did you find directing over Zoom? Um, I agree with the rest in that once you get into it, it's just a piece of technology that we use to communicate. Um, I think the main thing really from a directorial point of view is how you suspend the disbelief that this is happening over Zoom. With this piece, it was fairly straightforward. It was a conversation before and it's a conversation now. It's just that instead of it taking place uh, in a lovely restaurant, is taking place on Zoom. Okay. Um, we do also have time for audience questions. If anyone would like to ask 
um, any of our lovely panel any questions, please do type it into the chat. Um, we do have one already. So um, this is from Kaio Choi, and they have asked, are theatre filmmakers able to access funding for projects? Is this getting easier or more difficult at the moment? Mm -hmm. Does anyone like to leap in? Um, I, 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 I find that that's a really difficult question to answer. I suppose uh, on the one hand, um, because of all the campaigning that we've been doing over the last few years, it might be slightly more easier, you know, um, being a creative of colour or theatre maker to actually um, uh, have more of an opportunity to dip into the funding. But by the same token, you know, at the moment, uh, we're in COVID times, you know, the economy is shrinking. There's greater competition as well. So I, I think it's, it's kind of, it's, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a game of two halves, really. Yeah. Um, Ming, are you able to share about how it went with you and British people and how you were able to make that film? Was it very different compared to your experience of theatre? Yeah, it was. I mean, I think we, we have um, the producer, Chi Tai, to thank for that because she put that all together. Um, she had come to see Citizens at Duddles and um, there was this scheme, The Uncertain Kingdom, which was a project of 20 short films that were fast response short films reflecting the UK in 2019. And there was an open call for 10 of those films. So Chi approached me to say, could we lift out an aspect of Citizens and put in a pitch for that? And we did. So... There was already a scheme set up. The funding was already there. It was just a question of who was going to get it. So we competed. I think there were 1,100 submissions for those 10 slots. And, and we got one. So, um, but, you know, Incredible. if she to see the show, if she hadn't come and said, do you want to have a go at this, um, it wouldn't have happened. But it was very low budget. I think it was a basic 10 grand for everybody. We all had the same flat fee funding. Um, and then I think you could raise up to five more through crowdfunding to you know to do a bit more post production stuff like that, but but that encompassed doc documentary films as well as fiction and animation. So I think you know obviously documentary films probably had a bit more money to play with in terms of what was on the screen, whereas you know if we were doing a fiction, we had the actors to pay, we had crew, um, we, we needed locations and and set and things like that. So you know it was very pared down, but I think it was all about the storytelling ultimately. Great, thank yep. you. And it, yeah, it is really interesting as well how many um, film projects do have roots in theatre to thank. And, you know, I feel like every time we have the awards round, you do also see that in terms of the award winners, often you can look back and trace their theatre careers before they move into film. So it is a really interesting ecology that we have here. Um, Pixen, are you. One last try. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I'm I'm having difficulty reconnecting because my internet keeps going. Ah, uh, okay. Don't worry then, don't worry. Can anyone hear this? Yeah, my I keep I keep losing my broadband. I think I think it's got to do with where I live. So listen, ladies, I'm ever so sorry. Don't I'm, worry, doing, don't I'm doing my best answering your questions, but I don't see all that well either. We, we, we can hear you, Pixie. Joe, did you want to ask a question and then I can try asking Pixie the question? Okay, we can, we can try it that way then. Yeah, um, well, well um, thank, thank you, Ming, but, but I, I can hear the question, right, but okay. my connection keeps going. And then I can't, I, I keep, to, to keep trying, um, getting you all back again. Okay, well, let's have a go and see because it seems to be a bit better at the moment. Um, that is, is the funny thing. Um, I think it's to do with where you are, Jodie, because I couldn't hear Unting properly either. Okay. Um, maybe I'll try asking you a uh, question. But I definitely, I heard, I heard Lucy, Jennifer and Ming Yu perfectly. And Ming Ho. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll so, so apologies. Link um, um, attempt I mean, to pass it on to you. Try you can't try getting hold. Um, well, 
listen, it's fine. I mean, it's fine. I can see you all, so I'm I'm sorry that I I don't have any input. <laughs> okay. Well, pick Sen or maybe Ming can yeah. ask them. I just wondered whether you could tell us a bit about how you first started acting because you were one of the first East Asian actors that we saw regularly on TV in the UK. Did you hear that, Pixon? No. Jodie was asking you, can you just talk a bit about how you started out in, in acting because you were one of the first pioneers of British East Asian actors that we used to see on telly um, and in, on stage. Um, you know, so how how was that for you? How did you start in the business? Oh, you mean you mean when I first started? Yeah, I think I think because I kind of fell into it, um, not not without trying, but because there were so few other actors around um, who are East Asian. But once the part came up, and if you're lucky to get one. Um, some, sometimes I did, um, but I think I was incredibly naive and I wasn't certainly wasn't ready for it. But I did get a part in a long-running comedy series called Mind Your Language, which became very, very successful. Unfortunately, uh, when that finished, I had trouble getting any other jobs because there was a terrible stigma attached to doing a program like that, um, especially with legitimate theatre. And it took me about seven years, well, definitely more than seven years to shake off that stigma. I, I, I was never, never invited to do any stage auditions or theatre auditions. It didn't affect my film jobs because film people will just audition whoever they fancy. So that that wasn't affected. Did, can I ask, Dixon, I, th I know we've talked about this before, but I think people watching might be interested to know, do you have any thoughts now about the character that you played in Mind Your Language, looking back on it? Because when I was growing up and I watched that, it was great to see somebody like you on the screen, but equally it was a very stereotypical show, wasn't it? All of the characters were playing national stereotypes well, it, yes yes and 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 it was very popular particularly among southeast asia but recently um i think the bbc showed something called british people um about immigrants who settled here and tried to make themselves british and there was one episode showing east asians and I remember somebody forwarded me the clip and they used they used my character as how not to depict an East Asian. And honestly, I was incredibly embarrassed by it. And I just wish nobody had turfed up the clip um, or, or, show, or shown that at that time. But at the time, obviously, it was a big break, wasn't it? Because it was on mainstream ITV primetime show, wasn't it? So at the time, you were you were quite pleased to do it. Yes, it was. It was also very two dimensional writing. I think some of the other characters had at least some subplots running through it, but the Chinese character and the Japanese character were completely one dimensional. Mm -hmm. We we couldn't we couldn't. Um, be seen to be saying anything else except something about Chairman Mao or mm. something about Ah So. Mm. So so that was already ridiculous. Mm. I think that just goes to yeah, sorry. I think that just goes to show that a lot of representation comes from the stages before you ever get near the screen. It's all to do with the development and the writing and the producing. Absolutely. You know, those writers in those days didn't probably didn't have any experience of characters like that in real life to write from. Yeah, and I think um, I didn't. I didn't quite hear. I didn't quite hear all of that. You got the gist of it. I think I, I was just saying, Pixen, that that um, representation comes from the development stages of a project. So things are changing gradually now because there's more awareness at the writing and directing and producing stage. 
I hope anyway. I think so. And I think it touches upon, you know, things that all of you have been talking about today about having those stereotype characters and perhaps there's nothing wrong with them if we have the broader representation that shows that that is not the only character. And it shows the power, I think, of having behind the scenes people pushing and making those changes and giving actors who, as Jennifer said, you know, don't have so much control, giving actors those parts and allowing them to show their skills and to show more voices. So I think having Pixen show that it's possible to be on screen at that time is still something that we're really grateful for. But it's really exciting hearing from all of you to hear about how things are changing and to hear about how you're taking more power and showing more voices on screen. Um, we don't have any more questions coming through, so I think we will probably wrap it up there. So thank you all so much for your time and for sharing with us. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear from all of you, and I hope everybody will continue to see and to support you in your careers. And thank you for joining this Stay Connected event. Uh, the next and final Stay Connected event will be on Thursday at 7 p.m., where Tangram will be sharing their latest Tangram Voices concert with us. But for now, thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you.